Welcome to BreezeLine, where the sky's the limit thanks to better internet. With lightning fast speeds up to one gig, you can game like a boss, stream like a pro, and watch like there's no tomorrow. Stream, watch, post, send, and trend. Do it all with our fiber-powered network, bringing you reliable, fast internet. Welcome to BreezeLine. Visit BreezeLine.com for latest offers. Service subject to availability. New customers in select areas only. Visit BreezeLine.com for details. Did you know that yearly Medicaid renewals will start again soon? This means millions of people who were enrolled in Medicaid during the pandemic may no longer be eligible for coverage. If this may impact you, the good news is you have options. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield can help answer your questions so you can find an affordable health plan for you and your family. We want you to feel confident you're covered. Click to learn more. Policy exclusions and limitations apply. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield is the trade name of Anthem Health Plans, Inc. Welcome to another BritFlix.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's guest is filmmaker Matt Hulse. Welcome to the show. Hello, thank you very much for having me. And I should say, welcome back to the show. Yeah, indeed. This is your second appearance. Uh, you're going to talk to us about your new film, Sound for the Future. You're also going to be telling us about three films that impacted everything in your adult life. Um, but before we do that, do you want to tell people or give people a brief synopsis of what Sound for the Future is? Well, Sound for the Future, I mean, it could be described in any number of ways, but the sort of the, the kind of pricey that seems to have stuck is that, that it's um, the story of Britain's youngest post-punk band, the Hippies, as told by the band's drummer, and I was the band's drummer. Hmm. Um, so this is like uh, n- 1979. Um, so it was me and my brother and my sister, um, as prompted and kind of managed by our mum. And we wrote about four and a half songs. Um, one was about rabies. One was about the assass- assassination of JFK. And the other was a kind of po- uh, dystopian poetic work that my brother Toby wrote called Terra Nova. Um, and then there were some other songs never really made made it onto the tape. And the tape was called a sound for the future. Ah, okay. So that's where the title of the film comes from. And I kept this tape for decades and always wondered if there was something could be made from this, possibly a film. The the the, the original project concept actually that was inspired to is form um in their late forties and with the original instruments and they would do covers of songs that had inspired them from the time and then those artists would respond in turn and do covers of the hippie songs. Right. Which didn't didn't happen, but it, it it's um out of the blue. Do you remember MySpace? I'm I Leighton Rocks is my Twitter handle and remain is and was the name I used when I got my MySpace page. Right, right. Well, we the hippies had a presence there, and um, out of the blue, this this electronica duo from Lausanne in Switzerland got in touch and said, "Could we do a cover of your song, Dallas City Ghost?" And I said, "Yeah, that would be that'd be really interesting to hear. See what you do." And at that moment, I thought, "Gosh, it would be inter- if they're going to go to that trouble, it would be interesting to film them doing mm-hmm. that." And that's where it tipped over into a film project, even though I didn't go and film them. It, it sort of suddenly shifted it from being a, a covers project to a to a film and um yeah we, we so it's kind of as a project it started out in 2010 so it's another slow burn and and yeah it's it's very difficult to describe this no no well let, let me well I, mean, I think it's, it's interesting because it's it, on the one hand it's it's um it's an autobiographical film obviously your your recounting mm. certain aspects of your life through the through the prism of the band and obviously the band being your family <laughs> that that that, mm. that brings up um memories of being a family but also you you travel about a bit in the film you go off to the far east you recreate things with 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 child actors playing the roles of you guys as kids but in the present so there's a, but also part of the film you you actually cover some of the um 
the process of that. You know, you, we, we see the workshops with the kids. Um, yeah, yeah, it's an a- 18 of them as well. It was quite a big, yeah, big undertaking. Um, and um, yeah, there's all sorts of, I mean, there's our, hundreds of hours of footage of the stuff yeah. we shot with them. Um, and, you know, only a certain amount made the, the cut. Um, they were absolutely brilliant to work with. And they're, they're, the, they're the kind of heart of the film, I would say. Mm. Um, and yes, we did something rather unusual, which was we, so we had these 18 kids and they all turned up to do auditions. Um, and obviously they, they, in their minds, they thought they were going for one of three roles. Yeah. But we knew before we even had the, the auditions that we were going to cast all of them. Um, regardless of what they did at the audition. <laughs> uh, and so we, we had a plan to have um, six sets of hippies, basically, um, and to be kind of conceptually willful and say, it doesn't matter if a seven-year-old black kid plays my sister, for example. Mm. And as he says in the film, you know, how am I supposed to look like her? I don't even have the right color of skin. <laughs> <laughs> You're not even a girl either, Emmanuel. You know what I mean? So it was a kind of um, play, like a play. You know, really, it was a it was a lot of play, loads of play and improvisation. Um, but the film also, you know, it's quite dark in places. It touches on some pretty dark stuff from my own experience. You no, know? no, no. Without, I was, was going to get to that. I mean, you 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 don't shy away from uh, from key emotions and uh, uh, memories of those emotions. Plus, plus how people feel today. Which is what's expressed in the mm. film. I mean, in particular, obviously, there's there's conversations with your mother, which get very emotional at, at, during the movie. Yeah. Um, was that something that you were prepared for, or was that a surprise as part of the process of the film? I mean, I mean, you know, my my previous films. I mean, the, I set about capturing things, and then that will inform the next steps. Um, so Ashley and I went. To Bristol to film my mum as and as a first step, you know, without any funding, which is where we got that that interview. Yeah, um, and um, very important part of the, the film it is. Um, and just to, to give you an example of, the, of my kind of modus, so in in that scene, she reads out a letter and it says, "A letter from a child." Yeah, and it's this emotional letter from a child who's just saying, "You know, mum, I." <laughs> Can't bear it. I'm weeping. I'm. I, I, when when will when when will I next see you? Because obviously this is a situation of divorce. We were living apart from our mum, and but it doesn't specify which child it's from. Um, and lines from that letter are extracted and used as lyrics in in other parts of the film and voice uh, narration. So it's kind of that letter is unpacked and sort of seeded throughout the, the the hundred minutes. So that by the time you get to the letter, you've already heard some of it without really realizing it. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. And that happens a lot with material. So we were kind of unpacking ephemera and, and um, poems from the time songs, photos, and then kind of throwing them all up in the air, seeing how they landed. Mm. And then, and then, with the editor, you know, doing it, making the, making the pattern work. It's, I, I like to say in the Q and A's I've had that it's a true story in as much as everything in it is drawn from life in one way or another. I, no, we haven't really invented anything such, mm. um, but it feels like it's like this crazy it's kaleidoscopic um, improvised thing, but actually it's quite tightly structured. Well, in, um, in that sense, then, we're given, in, in, in a musical way, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But given, given what you said there about your process, then, I mean, a question I ask a lot of documentarians when I have them when I have them on is about perception at the beginning and the end. So there's the thing you perceive you're going to make, and then there's the perception of it when you've made it. Now, obviously, given this yeah. is about you and your family, what perceptions about yourself have shifted in the process of making this film? Um. I, I not not a huge amount because I think I've my you know my mum always says to me I was born with with full self knowledge, so you know and that's what I was exploring. I say at the start of the film I want to embody the film. I don't I don't want it to be about these stories. I need I want it to be it. Mm. So an example of that is um, just as an aside, uh, my dad 
appears in it very, very fleetingly, just says a few words. Um, and audiences sometimes say, well, why isn't your dad in it more? Why didn't you go into more depth? I said, well, because he didn't want to be in it really at all. And that's as much as he wanted to give. So I just thought, well, that represents him. And if the audience feel like, oh, the dad's missing, then that's because that's what it feels like for me in 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 the real world. Right, <laughs> so okay. that's what I want, you know, rather than, you know, discussing that at all in the film, you just give people the experience mm. um, and then they have the experience. That's the hope. And so that this is why, you know, my mum's in it a lot because she's very present in my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and my brother's not in the film at all. So <laughs> that's true. That's true. Well, no, it's just, it just, yeah. because obviously we don't, we don't often do self-examination to the degree that your film does. Mm. So I just wondered how that, you know, you, you're having to look at yourself like, like from a helicopter above, but also you're the person looking in the camera at the same time. So it's like, I just wondered if that could, if that affected you. I mean, also, how do you remain unconscious of, of yourself while trying to make a film about yourself? Um, it's because I'm a performer as well. So I'm performing myself. Right. Okay. Um, if you see what I mean, and, and, and also performing as other sort of aspects or characters and responding to things. Um, yeah, I, I'm, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Has it, has it, I've been asked several times, was it cathartic? Hmm. And in a way, but I think more importantly than that, I don't need to make that film again. It's obviously something I needed to do, to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and now I've done it. It's like, whew, well, thank goodness for that. I would never, I wouldn't make a film like that again. You know, at the start of the film, I said this might be my last film because it felt like, right, I'm going for this full on, as if I'm going to die tomorrow. You know, mm. and um, that's that's the way we we went for it. But whilst having a lot of fun as well, and it's really funny in places. And um, uh, yeah, it's. But I know it's. I don't find it difficult to lay myself on the line for my art. I mean, that's once I decided to become an artist, I just thought, well, let's all do it all in or just don't bother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You so, know, so I'm, I'm very committed in that way. And, and no, no, there's no, there's no, the, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no, quarter given, there's no quarter given in this film, Matt, that's for certain. Um, now, <laughs> one of the things that struck me that was interesting and because, because you, you talk about yourself being like the youngest post punk band and, there's lots of scenes with you mm. playing around with uh, Malcolm McLaren's gravestone. Yeah. Which I guess is sim- symbolic of the enduring nature of punk, I think, or your or your love of it. But I mean, and because I, I interviewed a writer recently, Richard Cabot, who's written a few books about, about punk and, but punk as in the nature of it, not the, not the genre of music. Like what it, it, it like we talked about the idea that, um, Goodness gracious, um, Rocky Horror Picture Show, because being be, being a punk rock movie, because the, the the original stage play was on was on the King's Road. You know, the, they were kitted out with gear from the same shops that then would become, you know, the houses of what became mm-hmm. punk rock attire, for want of a better expression. Um, so it's just this idea of, I mean, in your life, in your lifetime, then what? How do you think punk has? changed and shaped to suit our times or as or is it irrelevant now and it's just a nostalgia thing um i would say it was it's post-punk not punk that's shaped me um, okay i was too young for the pistols really i mean, I remember you know i remember that there was a record on the radio that was banned because i think my mum must have spoken about it yeah um but i was only what six or something when that mm. But, but you, but you feel, but I'm thinking about feature malcolm mclaren who obviously was like one of the Svengalis of yeah so the reason he's I don't particularly admire or like him, but my mother does. And in and, and the what so in within the film it says, you know, Mum was inspired by Malcolm McLaren and she saw herself as a kind of Svengali of the, Oh I see. Him. Sorry, sorry, I forgot that. As he was as he was the Sven yeah. But it's okay. It's, I've been asked that a few times, so it may not I may not have um, clarified it well enough in the film. But um yeah, because it would appear that I'm obsessed by him because you know I'm kissing his head. Stone yeah, yeah, yeah. Sticking my fingers up his nostrils and dancing, but um, actually, it's me just being a cheeky, irreverent, punky guy towards this this man that we should be revered. <laughs> so, and I think he would have approved of that. So, yeah, I'm honouring like it's like you know, acknowledging Shakespeare or something. <laughs> if you're going to talk about, you know, he he was like the kind of grandmaster, wasn't he, of, of a certain um, 
social concept. He was he certainly was a ringmaster for what became popular out of punk, that's for certain. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, but the the I mean that I was just you know, I mean, seven or eight, nine years old. I'm just, I just liked sticking my fingers up and spitting and doing, you know, just the sort of being like a bit bad, but like not violent, just sort of cheeky. And that all of that appealed to me. And I was very fond of John Lydon, mm. um, as John Lydon, not Johnny Rotten as much, um, and followed really early days of public image and stuff. I thought that was all really powerful and great um we're still quite you know still quite fond of him but i think if if we can so take one thing that's sort of post-punk is that it's that that diy aesthetic that you can just create something out of nothing that's on your table that's already in your room or on your table and, and yeah. that is 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 so it's informed my way of of working definitely and through lockdown i quite enjoyed lockdown because it, it limited gave creative limitations and from that I produced a huge amount of work for Instagram and um, performances and poetry and songs and little films just from what was in in the bedroom really and I don't think I would have had that capacity had I not kind of engaged with with punk and post punk how can people see sound for the future it is available to rent or buy online um via the usual channels really it's youtube um, Google Play, um, Net is it on Netflix? No, yes, I think it's on Netflix and on Prime. Prime, that makes no. Sense. I don't think no. It's not on Netflix. Netflix, you can't rent. You can't rent or buy on Netflix. Oh yeah, okay. So Prime, <coughs> Google Play, YouTube, and Apple Store. There you go. Moving swiftly along, three films that impacted everything in adult life. I'll just run the rules by the audience for those that are tuning in for the first time. Matt has given me three titles, which are films that have impacted everything in his adult life. We are going to talk to those film titles, and but Matt is doing this against the clock. So every time we hear this sound... You hear that okay, Matt? Yeah, I hear that. that that's already making me anxious. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the five minutes are up, and then we can, we can finish our sentence or two, but we'll move on to the next title. And we'll discuss that for five minutes too. Does that seem clear to you, Matt? I'll do my very best. All you can do is talk about your memories and why this film is important to you and, yeah. and all those kind of things. It's really, this isn't before, film studies for the BFI. This is more about our relationship <laughs> with film as much as anything else. Okay, no, that, that's that's cool. And, that, and that's interesting in relation to what I've chosen. Um, yeah, could I just, just before we start though, um, there was a, 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 there's a film that I'm, avoiding talking about um in favor of the other three and that film is star wars 4 i mean that was my first important cinematic experience and um but i think it doesn't deserve much more attention <laughs> it certainly doesn't need much more attention but yes doesn't i need get, more attention. i get your but there point is, there is one one thing that i did take away from that and you, were, you were talking earlier about why why just certain things from childhood stick in your head and that is the shot of the land speeders going through the desert and the light. That's, that's the thing around the light. Um, and that come, that that will just as a sort of little prequel to talking about the other three. So starting with number one on your list, we've got 2001, A Space Oddity, obviously Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece. Why is that such an important film to you? When did you see it? Where did you see it? Well, we were taken to, so, so around that time, sort of late seventies, um, our mum, our parents were divorced. Mum was living in Cambridge, and when we used to visit her in the holidays, she would sometimes take us to the Cambridge Arts Theatre. And she took us to see 2001: A Space Odyssey when I must have been eight years old, wow. which is a bold thing to take a child to. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> I amazing. I had absolutely no idea what was going on, no idea whatsoever. Um, but at the same time, it was absolutely thrilling and terrifying. And of course, at that age, you believe the apes are real apes. So all the stuff that now looks a little bit shonky, you know, I, I genuinely thought they were real apes doing that. Um, now, there's a few things that really stick out from it is um, the monolith, just the, the just the presence of the monolith is just, even if I think about it now, gives me 
you know, an eerie feeling. And um, curiously, in Reading, where I we were living in term time, um, there was a development in the Mary's Butts area, which is um, early 70s, and they were picking up on these hexagonal forms and stuff you see in 2001 and indeed Star Wars 4. And there is this large black triangular clock um like black marble yeah that to all intents and purposes is like the monolith and that's you know i walk past that every day <laughs> um so uh, that, that film is kind of infused into my experience of reading at that that point in time um and what else jumps out? The um, the sequence with the psychedelic tunnel. You know, he's like flying yeah. down a wormhole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he sees himself on his deathbed, and then he kind of turns into a baby, but <laughs> or something. I yeah, mean, yeah. In my mind at that time, and in my mind now, I have absolutely zero idea what's going on, except that it's kind of about light, time, um, to a certain extent, memory. It's sort of, sort of it's kind of about the. Uh, the entirety of life and existence, and yet also about not very much at all, with, with good costumes. But, al- but also that idea of messing around with time, Kubrick almost mm. introduces the idea of the uncanny then, because we're no longer, no longer sure where we are and when we are from that point. No, and I think I, you can see that you get, it's really only Lynch's, David Lynch's films that could be the same feeling, you know, as that, as 2001. So it's this tapping into some, you know, the subconscious and kind of basically he's, it's, you know, and he's addressing the idea of death and eternity and, and some massively important things. And when you're eight, you just kind of, what is going on? But you, you're kind of scared because it's so, you, you know, scared by the enormity of the, the concept. It's like, it's really um, facing, you know, mortality in a film. Um, and I saw it again recently. I mean, some of those scenes are quite, you know, they made me laugh because they're a bit kind of <laughs> slightly rubbish, you know, in the production values, and yeah. things, which is a terrible thing to say. I know Kubrick was obsessed about production values, but um, they 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 did what they could at the time with special effects and things. Had you, out of interest, had you seen Star Wars at this point? Um, yes. Okay, so you had a space, you had a space opera already, sort of. Get, sort of already understood, and then you go see this. Well, yeah, I, I think so, Stuart. Um, I can't remember exactly because they were well. Like, we, we went to see Star Wars um in the first week of its release, uh, in Leicester Square. It was for my brother's birthday, so when I think that's June. Yeah, June seventy seven. Could it be? I'll take your word for it. I don't. I don't know. So it's. I think I would have seen it. Yes, because then. We only started visiting Mum in seventy eight, I reckon. And what was sorry? So again, what was the con? What was the what was the event that they were showing two thousand and one that your mum took you to? Because obviously two thousand and one is a nineteen sixty eight film, isn't it? It was just the the, the Cambridge the Cambridge Arts Theatre. It was okay. just the, like the local art cinema, which is now the Picture House. And do you have any recollection of the conversation with your mother after the fact? Like, um, the uh, bell saved you. <laughs> um, I can't remember discussing it with her. I can't remember discussing it. Right then, moving swiftly along, sir, to 1977 for the release of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, a film I said just before recording that I saw only seen this as an adult, so I'm interested to know what how, how does a child receive this film? I I just absolutely... Loved it. I think we saw this in a cinema in, in Reading. Um, mm. So by this point, obviously, I'd seen. I may have. I would have seen Star Wars and, and presumably, possibly two thousand one. So you know, it was kind of in a realm of films that I was uh, familiar with from a, from quite young. Um, I love everything about that film. I mean, it's um, also as I was saying before that there were some things in it now that that are sort of slightly laughable, but when you're that age, you, you believe everything. Mm. Um, and what, what, what I find really interesting is, is it's not really thought of as a, as a, as a kind of 
romance film, is it? But it's very, very romantic. Um, so, and there was some stuff kind of going on parallel with my life at the time. So our parents had divorced and I'd had that experience of that atmosphere Mm. that you get in a home and you and then you're a kid and the, and the adults are like you did you know you, you're trying to behave you think it might be your fault or there's all that weirdness and they capture that brilliantly in in that film um and yeah it's it's basically so it's a sort of story of, of marital breakdown I'm yeah, they, I mean, they don't they don't soft soapy on that at all, do they? They basically no, no, when 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 Dreyfus's family are out of the film, they're out of the film. They're, they're, you know, he's, yeah, he's yeah, going forward doing fun. this mad mission. <laughs> well, that's because he built a mountain inside the lounge. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's always um, going to cause a bit of trouble. Yeah, and and yeah, it's, so it's a sort of it's romantic in that he's he, he he's looking for this kind of something bigger, something more, more grandiose, and and he 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 pairs up with that that beautiful woman that I'm still in love with. Um, in her denim shorts and they, you know, off they go towards the light, mm. the light again, light's so important to me. And to find this sort of sense of destiny. Um, and uh, yeah, all of that I, is somehow, it gets a bit overlooked, I think, with all the, with the special effects and all, all the other stuff. Um, one other thing that really struck me at the time was Francois Truffaut yes. playing this kind of specialist linguist scientist mashup <laughs> in his white shirt with his sort of tie slightly ragged and he is brilliant um and there's this whole scene which i think is absolutely astounding where you've got the the sign language the five the hand signs for the five tones yeah communicate with the extraterrestrials um and that uh ultimately led to me making that film dummy jim i think so it gave me an early interest in sign language and the idea of being able to communicate non-verbally okay um and the connection it there with tones um i think about that quite often today when i'm making music um you know that that scene with the 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 the, 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 the scientists on the ground and then the mothership and that communication and that mm. incredible electronics um babbling between the two the joyous joyous thing um that's informed the way I write music, music I listen to, even um, so, yes, a music concrete kind of idea. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's amazing, isn't it, that such a simple musical phrase from a movie became. I mean, if you hear it, you know, you're there, aren't you? I mean, even like yeah, I said, I didn't yeah, see the I film mean, until as but I knew, I knew the musical phrase from the film for a long time. Yeah, it, it, it's it's brilliant. I did a piece once actually. It was called Monsieur Hulot's Close Encounters because I noticed that. Um, the the main theme from Vacances de Monsieur Hulot is um, do, 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 do. I thought, hang on a second, that reminds me of Close Encounters. So I pulled the two together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> so, was, yes, it was called Monsieur Hulot's Close Encounters. One of the things, like I said to you, I didn't watch this till I was an adult. And what struck me watching it in 2020, with 2020, only with 2022 eyes, is that if you look at Richard Dreyfuss's character now and go, who would be who would that character be in a 2022 film? He would be the conspiracy nut bad guy. There's no way he would be a hero because they'd be, it, you know, the way that the, the way that we are all so fractured and divided now. That idea of a of somebody being like destroying a family in pursuit of this mad mission, that would make that make you a bad guy. But in this in this film, they never make him out to be a bad guy. It's like his his mission is quite what do you call it? Um, Honorable's too strong a word, but it's it's it's. With the calling, isn't it? Yeah, it's he's genuine, not, isn't it? He's not hes not trying to destroy his life, but he can't stop it. He's compelled to do what he's doing. Yeah, it's a bit of, I mean, you could argue, it's a bit, I'll finish on this clanger, he's a bit of a Jesus character. Yes, yes. <laughs> which is a lovely segue uh, for your third <laughs> film, which is The Man Who Fell to Earth. Yes. The Man Who Fell to Earth. This was another one we saw in the Cambridge Arts Theatre. Okay. And um, we went primarily because it was Bowie. Um, I think my mum already would have known some of Nick Rogue's earlier work, like performance and stuff. But uh, you know, we're all we're all all were and still are Bowie fans, and we were listening a lot around that time to Changes One, the first compilation, and also Low and some of Heroes and that that kind of Berlin period. Mm. So I already had a sense of this mood. 
of Bowie in that that realm. I don't remember like again another film that probably we were way too young to be in because hmm. um, it's got there's the whole sort of gun gun and sex scene, isn't there? In the I mean, it's literally an exit certificate, so yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's stuff in there that you know, just I probably would have just had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone why, you know. Yeah. Um, Can I ask you then, how do you, how do you, do you remember get a problem getting into cinemas to what? I mean, obviously with your mum, but that doesn't get you past being an 18 film. Well, do you remember, do you, do you remember Sean Barker, my mum's lodger, who's in Sound for the Future? Yeah. He was the guy on the door. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. There you go. Um, I don't know whether for free, but certainly he would just sneak us in. And, and you know, my mum's incredibly... Was an incredibly liberal mother, and she, and she was like, "Children shouldn't be um, protected from from art, you know." Because she knew it wasn't going to be just randomly violent and stupid. She knew it would have some guile. Mm. Um, and I guess if she, I mean, guess if she sat with you, it's not like it's not like going watch a film. I'm going off to do something else. No, no. Um, and yeah, and it was Bowie. I mean, we basically forgive him for anything except for the the Linguini incident. Have you seen that? He made a film called The Linguini Incident, which yeah. I think he's tried to bury. <laughs> it's <laughs> absolutely terrible. <laughs> anyway, so I won't forgive him for that one, but everything else he does, he, he gets away with it in our family anyway. Um, and there's a couple of things I remember specifically from the film. There's one scene where he he kind of... So I don't remember the plot. I'm not that interested in, in plots, really. I'm interested in the light, you know. And um, he has this kind of pre internet type setup where it has this sort of globe okay and he places it onto this stack and so maybe it's a pyramid or some sort of system where you put these things in and you can kind of channel all the information from around the world and this is the point when he's become i guess the fallen alien isn't it because he, he becomes kind of human doesn't he in, in a sense in that, and that's yeah it's kind of an assimilation problems. isn't there there's like this idea yeah of... and this is when he becomes you know like um megalomaniac i mean he looks brilliant because he's got fantastic shades on and like beautiful silk and you know, everything looks looks brilliant and he's surrounded by all this light and information and becomes kind of all powerful as i as i recall um yeah and we're, we're just there's a lot of interesting landscape in that as well, isn't it? There's some mm. moonscapes and, and but one note about that film is it there was a retrospective of Nick Rogue's films at the Cinema Nova in Brussels, right. and they programmed my short film Hotel Central from 2000 as the kind of short before the feature. Oh wow! Um, and then the same thing happened at the Film House in Edinburgh as well a couple of years later. Um, and I wasn't there, but Nick Rogue was. So Nick Rogue has seen my short film. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and, you know, I wasn't, when we made Hotel Central, I wasn't thinking about Man Who Fell to Earth at all. But obviously to, to the programmers, it's like there's this really strong connection. So there you go. That film had a, must have had a very big impact on me so much that I can't even see it anymore you know <laughs> well, for, I, I was going to say for others to, for others to be able to see it not once but twice kind of that is quite an amazing subconscious link between the two that you've made yeah I mean I suppose there's a very literal thing in the, the, the Hotel Central starts with you know there's a guy that but you know he didn't fall but he 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 sort of appears on earth oh, um, okay. on, on bed but um, but yes I think it's more the mood of it and the, the kind of British sensibility as well is sort of quite surreal, fashion aware, so mm. stylistically they they may. I need to go and watch the watch Manifel to Earth again. See see what it's like. <laughs> see what it's actually like. <laughs> well, look, that's our time up, mate. Brilliant. That was very very entertaining and very interesting. And wowzer, seeing seeing those films as a kid. That's quite. That's quite a film education. Um, yeah. C can I, can I sneak one last thought in on Close Encounters? Sure, you can. Yeah. Um, it's it's Spielberg's toys moving around on their own thing. Okay. Um, which it happens in several of his films. So toys come to life. Um, 
as if by magic, which is, you know, spooky when you're a kid. But that definitely influenced my early early work because the first films I made were stop frame animations. Okay. Um, kind of inspired by, at the time, by, you know, Czech animator Schwankmeyer. But actually, when I saw the, the, the Close Encounters again recently, I thought, ah, I, you know, it's the magic of that. And, and I wanted to do, I wanted to be able to make things move around on their own. Indeed. Um, <laughs> and yeah, the, the I, I mean, because as a kid as well, you, you imagine your toys having a life, which obviously yeah. is brilliantly done on, brilliantly showed in the film Toy Story, but we're obviously in the, <laughs> them coming alive literally in front of your eyes mm. is a, is yeah, a magical it's, thing. It's kind of, you, you will it, don't you, as a child? Yeah, exactly. Come on! Well, let's remind yeah. people then, how, how and where can they see Sound for the Future? Sound for the Future is now streaming online for rent or to buy. And that was, what was the list? It was YouTube, Apple Store, Google Play, and Amazon Prime. Well, it just gives me to say thank you very much for joining us on the Bitflix podcast. Okay, thanks, Stuart. I, I, that was fun. <laughs> Did you know that yearly Medicaid renewals will start again soon? This means millions of people who were enrolled in Medicaid during the pandemic may no longer be eligible for coverage. If this may impact you, the good news is you have options. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield can help answer your questions so you can find an affordable health plan for you and your family. We want you to feel confident you're covered. Click to learn more. Policy exclusions and limitations apply. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield is the trade name of Community Insurance Company. Welcome to BreezeLine, where the sky's the limit thanks to better internet. With lightning fast speeds up to one gig, you can game like a boss, stream like a pro, and watch like there's no tomorrow. Stream, watch, post, send, and trend. Do it all with our fiber-powered network, bringing you reliable, fast internet. Welcome to BreezeLine. Visit BreezeLine.com for latest offers. Service subject to availability. New customers in select areas only. Visit BreezeLine.com for details.